and right between legs one and legs two, we should be able to find the mouth parts of the mite, but instead we find a very jagged hole. Fascinating. Interesting. Interesting. Now, we wanted to go even farther just to make sure that they were aware that this hole was made by the mouth parts of the mite itself. And so we took the time in the electron microscope to actually measure uh, the shape and size of the mouth parts of the mite and to compare that to the hole. And wouldn't you know it, exact same size. That's definitely a hole caused by the calissary and subcapitula in the mouth parts uh, of this mite species. Uh, we've color coded it here so that you can see what parts of uh, the mouth actually created this hole. And that leads us to a really important point here. We say that Varroa destructor has two life stages, right? It has the reproductive stage and the what? Phoretic stage, correct? Or actually maybe not correct. Because those are the two that we attribute to this organism. However, the term phoretic means something very specific that probably doesn't actually apply to this organism, does it? The word phoretic is related to creatures who use their host as a vehicle and only as a vehicle. They attach to this creature and they use it to move them from point A to point B, but they value that organism so much as a vehicle that they refuse outright to feed on that creature. And we have been saying for decades now that Varroa destructor is phoretic, meaning that during a stage of its life cycle, when it is on adult bees, it suspends its feeding behavior. That's another reason why these researchers told us um, we, we don't think that this organism is feeding uh, on those bees, and we think that you're going in the wrong direction with this project. And they actually left uh, our research team uh, to join another set of researchers who are about to release a paper uh, declaring once and for all that Varroa does not feed on adult bees because they are phoretic. Now, this is a great example of a phoretic organism. This is a pseudoscorpion. It's attached to itself to a beetle because this beetle has wings, and the pseudoscorpion does not. But I want you to look very closely at how it's chosen to attach itself. These are the mouth parts of the pseudoscorpion right here, and they are nowhere near this beetle. It's attached to itself with one of its claws, and it is not going to feed on that beetle because the moment you start feeding on that creature, you create an incentive for your removal. However, if you just want to use it as a bus, it's probably not going to care very much about it. Exhibits A, B, and C. Check out this dragonfly. It has a bunch of water mites on the underside of its body. If all of those creatures started feeding on that dragonfly, they would probably kill it. But if they just want to use it as a bus, it'll let it stay on. And they'll fly those water mites to another source of water they can live on. And you might have been wondering what this creature is right here. Uh, so that is actually an American burying beetle, and it is covered in mites. And it doesn't seem to care because none of those mites are feeding. They just hang out on its body and allow that beetle to move them from one location to the other. This is what foracy is. Is Varroa phoretic? Well, I thought I'd made it very clear by showing that the mites were actually piercing through the integument of the bees. They're actually pushing their mouth parts into the bees. I thought it was very clear that they are feeding on our bees. But those researchers uh, came back to us after we showed them those pictures, and I got to say, I was at least a little bit smug. I'm like, y'all left our team, but you won't be coming back now. Look at this. Look what I got for you. I want you to see this right here. And uh, they said, uh, uh, well, those are some really good images. Uh, but it doesn't show that the mites are actually feeding on the bees. It's very possible they just wedged themselves in there so tightly that their mouth parts just kind of popped through. But you haven't shown feeding. You've just shown that the mouth parts pierce the host. So I had some feelings at the time that I had to get over. Uh, it's possible that I said a few bad words. I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud of it. But then I realized, you know what? These researchers are actually encouraging me to be a better researcher myself. Because if I'm attempting to overturn work that has been based on assumption for decades, I cannot make any assumptions in this process myself. And so in order to move forward in the best way possible, I had to get back into the right frame of mind and remember, nope, this is actually good for me as a researcher. So we undertook another set uh, of uh, microscopy, and this is general light microscopy through thin sections of a bee that has a mite feeding on it. And you get to see something really fascinating here. I'm really glad that we did this for two reasons. Uh, one, look very closely here. 
Uh, let me help you orient. This is one of those plates that I was telling you about earlier, that's a sternite. This is Vero destructor that was right in between those plates. We had to push it back a little bit in order to get the embedding media in there. And this is the membrane, that very, very, very thin membrane is between all of those plates. It's called the intersegmental membrane. It is incredibly thin, and that is where the mites are actually piercing through the host. But what I really want you to focus on is this gooey stuff back here. Now, does anyone have any idea what this tissue might be? Come on now, I believe in you guys. Uh -huh. I hear fatty tissue dis- Oh, never. Oh, look at you, all right, all right. Uh, both of you are correct. Uh, so someone said fatty tissue, someone said liver. Uh, this, everyone, is called the fat body. It is the liver of your honeybees, and it is an incredibly important set of tissue that I'm going to ensure you get well acquainted with in a little bit of time that I have left in this presentation. Because it seems very clear that there is an interesting association between this parasite and this tissue. Exhibit A. When Varroa destructor is not present between those plates of the bee, this tissue here runs all the way under this membrane and forms a very dense layer right here. However, when Varroa destructor is in between these plates, we find that whole sections of this tissue appear to be missing. And we have found a direct correlation with the amount of time that that mite spends in between the plates of the bees with how much of that tissue is gone. Fascinating. Now, still, we're not sure what's going on here. We're going to look even closer. So this is an even closer image of what you saw before. That is one, uh, one cell of fat body that happened to be left behind. Uh, and it's really helpful that that was there because it helped us determine what this splotch of goo is over here. Uh, I believe the, uh, the technical term that we use in science for this is schmutz. So we kept seeing the schmutz right here uh, inside of the bees. And we were wondering, what is this? This goo. And what we found by comparing this to that one cell that was left behind is that this is actually the internal contents of fat body cells. The mites are somehow, in a means that is not mechanical, it's not that they are chewing, but somehow they're releasing something into the bees that is breaking down their cells into a goo. They are literally turning our honeybees into cream of honeybee soup, and that is problematic. But the tissue that they're targeting is of great concern to beekeepers because the fat body tissue does a lot of things in your bees. And uh, so, just for a moment here, this image makes it clear to us that we have been using the wrong term for a whole section of Burroughs life cycle. When they're on your adult bees, they are not just sitting there, they're not just waiting for their reproductive cycle to get restarted, they are actively feeding on your adult bees. And <coughs> You might be thinking, well, that tiny little organism is feeding on a really large set of tissue. It's probably fine, right? Every time this parasite feeds, it releases a very large volume of its saliva into the bee's body. And the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture, has determined that these parasites feed uh, once every 1.4 to 2 hours. And they can remain on adult bees anywhere between three and 14 days. So they can very quickly excrete enough saliva into your bee's body to break down the entirety of this fat body. And that is deeply concerning. Uh, what was also a great concern is that when we got even closer to the wound, we started to see these sets uh, of bacteria that were present here that are closely related uh, to the Melsococcus bacteria that we know of as European fowl brood. And we keep seeing these uh, parasitic bacteria introduced into these wound sites. And the most disturbing aspect of this is that it appears that the immune system of the bees is doing absolutely nothing to fix that situation. Curious indeed. Don't worry, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but I promised you three alternative facts, and Sammy likes to tell the truth. So the third of the alternative, uh, alternative facts today is that Varroa has a phoretic phase. They do not. Uh, and we're going to need to update uh, some of our literature uh, around this, and thankfully we have already started. 
Um, varroa feeds on bees during both stages of its life cycle. So it feeds when it's below the capping on the larvae, it feeds when it is not below the capping when it is on your adult bees, uh, and it can cause substantial damage during both sets of these phases. And this particular image is one that we were very proud of uh, over the course of this process because uh, we were uh, actually able to show something really cool here. Um, so this is a cross-section uh, using uh, electron microscopy. Um, and you know what? One of the things that's the most fascinating about it is that you can look at this tissue, this cross-section of tissue in your bees. So this is the inside of Varroa destructor. This is the inside of the honeybee here. And all of that glue that you see there is fat by the tissue. And what's fascinating is that on the inside of the mite, inside of this digestive system, you see a tissue that seems to be of very similar consistency. Hmm. Fascinating. Very interesting. More clues for you there. And uh, normally that picture gets more oohs and ahs when I unveil it, so uh, I'm a little bit disappointed in this crowd, but it's all right. It's okay. It's all right. It's fine. Uh, so that is what the fat body tissue, oh, I'm going to have to speed up before we get to questions. All right, that is what the fat body tissue looks like inside of a honeybee when it's been dissected. You can cut down the side of your bees, uh, remove the digestive system, and all of that glue that you see on the inside of this body, all of that is fat body tissue. It is the largest continuous organ inside the bee's body, and they need plenty of it for plenty of reasons. So my question was, is this what the mites are actually at? Is this the tissue that the mites are consuming? Well, in order to figure this out, I decided to employ a set of methods that every researcher since the beginning of time has always wanted to use. I got to solve a problem in science using glowing fluids, because that's what we do. We love this kind of stuff. Uh, if you ever look at like those little clip art pictures of scientists, there's always a guy with two glowing tubes. I got to be that guy, except way brown. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, the two sets of fluids are really fascinating. The yellow one uh, is called urine O, uh, and it is really helpful to use in these circumstances because it is fat-phobic. Uh, so it is a, a lipophobic uh, uh, biostain, and it will remain suspended in a fluid. Um, so it will remain suspended in a fluid that is primarily water. And so that was used to stain the bee's blood. And then we used Nile Red to actually stain the fat body of the bees. Nile Red has the exact opposite set of biochemical properties. Uh, it will attach to fats, it will embed itself into those fats, and uh, it is wonderful because if it is ever dislodged for any reason, it ends up in an aqueous substance in something that is primarily water. It stops glowing altogether. So this is what your bees look like if you were to feed them both of these substances. That is the abdomen of a honeybee lights out, that's been fed urine and oh, there's a lot of blood in this body, so it's kind of obscuring some of the glowing from the fat body, but if you look closely, you can see that red tinge there. That's fat body tissue, uh, and that is what a sample of the hemolymph looks like when extracted, and a sample of the fat body tissue. So here's what we're expecting. The idea is that if we feed these biostains to the bee, and then allow the mites to feed on the bee, we can determine, based on the glow coming from the mice digestive system, which of these tissues it consumed. If the mites glow red, we know that they're feeding on the fat body. If the mites glow yellow, we know that they're feeding on the bee's blood. Yeah, right? <laughs> so, at this point, I gotta say, I was pretty proud of myself. I'm like, all right, okay, we got some data here. And then I did it 67 more times because, you know, statistics. Uh, and we were able to say with very, 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 very strong uh, statistical significance that Varroa destructor is consuming a rather high volume of the bee's fat body. Uh, very, very, very little of the fluorescence that's produced here is being produced in the yellow range from the blood of the bees. While there is some blood that is getting into the mite's body, it is mostly fat body that is being consumed. And even when we look closer at these mites, you can make out the entire shape of the digestive system just in corpuscles of fat body tissue uh, that have been consumed by this mite. And I'm going to move a little bit faster because I want to make sure that I get the opportunity to explain to you why this is important. Uh, because this is about the portion of the presentation where uh, people start to ask me, why should we care? 
If the mites are feeding on the bees' blood or if they're feeding on the bees' fat body, either way, they're still damaging our bees and we should be deeply concerned, correct? I agree. However, I think that it is actually of substantially greater concern that these organisms are feeding on the bees' fat body than their blood. And let me explain why. The paradigm that we were originally working under was that this organism is pretty much like a tick or a mosquito. Uh, it attaches to the bees, removes a small amount of that bee's blood, and then it moves on with its life. So think about it this way. A mosquito lands on you, sucks out a small amount of your blood, flies away. You're not too concerned about that, right? Now, what if a mosquito landed on you, about this region of your body, liquefied your liver, sucked that out, and then flew away? Would you be a bit more concerned? Yeah, yeah, I am as well. Oh, yes, <laughs> I am as well. And here are a few reasons for that. The fat body has nine essential functions that it conducts within the bees, and all of these things are incredibly important to the development of the bees. I'm going to go through a few of them for you, uh, and then I'm going to detail the last part of this experiment, uh, and uh, that will be the end of this presentation for the day. But pay close attention to what the fat body inside of your bees does. Now, you might be thinking, I've never even seen fat body before. If you've been a beekeeper for any amount of time, I can tell you, you are incorrect in that assumption. Because you've seen brood, and your brood, their skin is transparent, and all of that white gooey stuff that you see on the inside of your brood, everyone, that is fat body. Uh, it is incredibly important to your adult bees, and it's incredibly important to your developing bees as well. They're pretty much just a gut surrounded by fat body, and all they do is eat and store energy in that fat body tissue in order to metamorphose into adult bees. Everything that it takes to take that squishy sac that has no legs and no eyes and uh, no ability to move, a very tiny rudimentary brain, no reproductive organs, everything that it takes to transition that organism into a fully functional adult bee is inside of that sac and is going to be reorganized by the fat body tissue. The fat body tissue uh, is actually um, present throughout the bee's body as this disconnected mass, and it actually floats around and helps to restructure all of those broken down pieces of the juvenile bee's body into what it will be as an adult bee. So it's incredibly important for metamorphosis. In addition, uh, it is an endocrine organ that releases the different uh, biochemical constructs and hormones that tell the bee when it is time to transition from being one stage of a larva to the next stage, and from that stage into being a pupa, and from a pupa into an adult. It also handles task shifting in bees. We've wondered for quite some time now, why is it that when Varroa feeds on bees, they shift their tasks substantially earlier than they should, or skip whole stages? Uh, instead of uh, doing the, the hive cleaning tasks and um, drawing out wax and all that, they just skip all of that and go straight from being uh, a nurse bee or sometimes the, the very earliest stages of a nurse bee, straight to being a forager. Now, some of the work that has described this is say we're not sure how the removal of small amounts of the bee's blood would create this specific pathology. But the actual destruction of the tissue that regulates that process, that makes perfect sense. In addition, there's a set of tissue inside the bee's body that regulates its metabolism. Honeybees are not the most aerodynamically designed organisms, and so in order for them to take off and fly from flower to flower as frequently as they have to, they need to be able to manage their metabolic activity very, very well. There's a tissue inside of their body that does that, and what tissue do you think that is? Okay, I'm a little bit concerned by uh, just how few people responded to that. I'm starting to think that you guys might be a little bit afraid of me. Now, I want you to know, I'm not sure how well this, this kind of thing gets across, but uh, I don't really do the trick questions thing. Uh, I am uh, I'm the son of a pastor, so this is going to come straight out of Sunday school, but in my presentations, um, it's going to be a lot like Sunday school, where the correct answer to every question is Jesus. <laughs> it's going to be like that, but with fat body. All right? Okay? All right. So, there is a tissue that regulates energy inside <laughs> the bee's body and allows them to travel from flower to flower with the energy that they need to be able to take off and get back to the colony. What tissue do you think that is? <laughs> That's what I was going to say, Jesus. <laughs> yes, all right, okay, all right. Uh, we're going to mark both of those answers right. So, uh, <laughs> the fat body is incredibly important, and what we found 
uh, is that bees that have been fed on by varroa oftentimes will have the energy to get to the flowers, but not the energy to make the return trip. Now, the same researchers who described this, uh, we're quick to say that uh, we don't know how the removal of a small amount of the bee's blood would cause this particular pathology. But if we consider that the tissue that regulates metabolic activity is the one that the mites are actually feeding on, this makes perfect sense. And it continues on this way as we go through this process, because uh, the bees have to balance water loss inside of their bodies. And so your honeybees are shiny. They're shiny because there's a coating of wax over their body that keeps water from evaporating out of their bodies. And that coating of wax actually comes from a tissue called the Precisely. The fat body creates that coating of wax that covers the bees uh, and allows them to continue all of that metabolic activity without having all the water evaporate out of their bodies. What we also know about Varroa is that when Varroa feeds on bees, for some reason, they emerge from, a, uh, from under the cabin with a waxy cuticle that is much thinner than bees that had not been fed on by Varroa. And as a result, water evaporates directly through that waxy cuticle, and those bees die a lot earlier than they would have otherwise from desiccation. Pesticide detoxification is also a product of the fat body. When there is a toxin that gets into the bee's body, they have a number of biochemical processes all regulated by the fat body that allow them to absorb that potentially toxic chemical into specially designed fat body cells that coat it in an oil that keeps it from reaching their neurons and other things that those pesticides would normally impact. When mites have fed on bees, they are substantially more susceptible to pesticides than they would be otherwise. We have been having arguments back and forth about whether the pesticides are killing the bees, and pesticides are killing the bees. However, Varroa destructor uh, is a, an essential link in this chain because what we've been wondering is how come these bees are dying from exposure to pesticides that they have been exposed to for decades and have been fine with? And I think we have found out what the link is there now. Because multiple studies now have shown that the lethal dosage for this pesticide uh, actually drops dramatically in the presence of varroa destructor. A much smaller dose uh, can kill a bee than would have otherwise. And it seems to be because the tissue that would normally detoxify it has been uh, heavily broken down. Um, so two more slides about this really quickly. Uh, immune function. Immune function is a function of the fat body. Uh, and it is, it is a very complicated process, but the very beginning of it starts with a set of peptides called antimicrobial peptides. They are created by the fat body, and the moment that a microorganism gets into the bee's body that shouldn't be there, uh, these antimicrobial peptides are released from the fat body, and they attack that organism. They also mark it for death so that large cells can come along and destroy that bacteria. If you don't have those antimicrobial peptides, the rest of the immune system doesn't work. And so this also helps us understand why we keep seeing bacteria in the wounds of the bees that are not being impacted by uh, the immune system of the bees themselves. And lastly, the telegenetics. What you're looking at now are the ovaries of the bees, and you might be wondering why I'm showing you bee ovaries when varroa don't feed on queens. Well, all of those eggs are packed with a set of proteins called the telegenics, and these are incredibly important because they reduce oxidative stress. So you, you might be wondering how these bees are actually able to survive the lengthy period of time that they're able to survive uh, during the winter. When they're awake the entire time, uh, these same bees that are surviving maybe 45, year, or 45 days uh, during the growing season are able to survive three, four, five months in some areas. It's because these metallogenins reduce oxidative stress in their bodies and allow them to live much longer because oxidative stress, stress is the primary thing that makes us age. These vitelligenins are created by the fat body. And so by the mites impacting the fat body, they are impacting the bee's ability to extend its lifespan through the winter. So it's impacting all of the most important processes of the bees by feeding on this tissue. The last thing that I had to look at over the course of this experiment, I'm going to have to go through this in two minutes flat. The last thing that I had to look at over the course of this project, I can already hear the reviewers in my mind now saying, what you've shown is that the mites feed on fat body of adults, but you haven't done anything. Ah, is time all, all the way up? No? Okay, two minutes. Three minutes, wonderful. No. 
Gotcha. So, uh, these mice are feeding on fat body, but are they feeding on fat body in the group? Well, in order to do this, I had to conduct uh, a set of feeding assays where I was allowed to feed the mice what I wanted them to consume and see if they were able to still produce eggs the way that they would normally be able to when feeding on brood. Uh, this was heavily advised against uh, by my committee and my advisor at the time uh, because people have been trying to feed Varroa in the lab for decades and no one's been able to get it to work. They haven't been able to get them to survive. They've not been able to get them to consistently produce eggs. And so uh, it was pretty clear that I was going to have a tough time with this. But I decided to take a crack at it anyway. So first I created these cute little mite motels out of compressed beeswax for the mites to live inside of. Uh, they mimic the size of drone cells so the mites would be very comfortable. And then I had to create decoy pupa for the mites to feed on. Now hopefully you were fooled because one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> One of these things is actually a size 5 gelatin capsule, and the mites were fooled by it. Uh, we would place the mites on the table uh, with uh, that uh, honeybee pupa, honeybee larva, and this gel capsule that's actually been wrapped in parafilm, so it will have the same tactile consistency uh, of honeybee brood. And what we found is that it wasn't until I actually rubbed that parafilm against bees so that it would have the same smell and taste of the bee that the mites were actually fooled by it. Because it's not the appearance of it that's really that important. It's the smell and taste because Varroa are blind. That one took me a while to get, and I'm a little bit embarrassed that it took so long. But rubbing it against the bees was really the, the key to getting the mites to actually feed on it. Uh, we cut a trough into the bottom, uh, filled this entire thing with hemolymph or fat body or some combination of the two. Uh, and that is what it looked like uh, for the whole setup. We used cling wrap as a lid so we could see straight through it. And uh, I've got one question for you for which the answer will not be fat body. So just warning here. Does anyone have any guess as to what that object is that was found on the clay wrap? Any guesses there? I'll even blow it up, make it a little bit larger for you. Any questions? I'm just saying that. Nice! Air high five to you. You made that quick for me. Now, normally, it's not until uh, I get a lot closer, but I, guys, I gotta tell you, I lost my mind when I saw this. Like, this was a huge deal. I, I, I had to calm myself down, Sammy. It's four o'clock in the morning. You very well could be delirious. It is not time to celebrate yet. Wait until tomorrow when you can get it into the electron microscope. Then we got it into the electron microscope and got the first, uh, so this is the first time people have been able to get Varroa destructor to actually reproduce in the lab uh, and produce eggs. And guys, I was so excited to see this thing. I even named it. It's adorable. I was so proud of her. Her name is PhD. Uh, <laughs> come on, y'all. They're going to give a brother his PhD. So, uh, what we found is that if you starve Varroa, they do not produce any eggs. Shocking, shocking. Uh, but if you feed them hemolymph, there is no significant difference in the amount of eggs produced uh, if they're starved or if they're fed the bee's blood. However, if you feed them fat body, and I mean any amount of fat body, 25% fat body uh, to the volume of the meal up to 100% fat body, and they will produce eggs. They produce the most eggs when fed 100% fat body. This is a survivorship curve also showing that they survive the best when fed 100% fat body, and that there is no difference in their survivorship when starved and when fed hemolymph of the bees. Uh, if you want to know more about this discovery, more than I can say in, more than I can say in this presentation, you can check out the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences because they published my thesis research. I was super excited about that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> they uh, told me during the publication process that it is unusual for uh, someone at my age and someone uh, coming out of his, his uh, thesis research to actually have that thesis research published in PNAS. So I was very excited about that. And furthermore, they put that image that I was talking about on the cover. So that was really cool too. Um, the conclusions to this is that these mites are not feeding on the bee's blood, and that changes the way that we think about how this organism uh, actually impacts honeybees. Uh, it also changes the way that we think about how we as beekeepers 
interface with this parasite. There are um, beekeepers who think that it's a good idea to add pollen patties to their colonies uh, in lieu of treating for the mice themselves. The idea is that the pollen will make the bees stronger and then they'll be able to fight off the mites on their own. Not a great idea because the tissue inside the bees that stores all that excess protein is the... And if they don't have enough fat body to store that excess protein, it can actually build up to toxic levels inside of the bee's body. So if you are a non-treatment beekeeper, you've chosen not to treat for whatever reason, uh, it, it is not helping at all for you to then put pollen patties into the colonies while you have a colony that is above threshold. You might actually be doing damage to your bees in that way. Uh, and lastly, there are uh, a couple of companies now that are attempting to use these findings to create uh, a new set of pesticides that can be used against the mites. Uh, more information will be available about that later, but I have signed some non-disclosure agreements, so I can't tell you about it right now. Thank you very much for listening to that lengthy presentation. I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but I would love to take them if possible. Thank you. Thanks, Sorry, we might have